go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, Christian um, emailed me today and asked me to chair the meeting tonight because he's under the weather, um, but he is going to be joining us online. Um, so we're just going to begin uh, with introductions. Um, if you just want to give us your name and um, briefly introduce yourself, and uh, we can go ahead and start with Craig, if that's okay. Okay. All right. I'm uh, Craig Fote. I'm the executive director of the Wayne Business and Industry Center at Wayne Community College. Uh, kind of a joint partnership between uh, the college with some state fundings and county funding, and uh, just look to uh, look at uh, workforce and uh, kind of analyze workforce needs and uh, do some uh, some other things as it pertains to business and industry. I'm Dr. LaShawn and Perkins. I work for the the Goldsboro Housing Authority, and I'm the Resident Services Coordinator. I'm Scott Satterfield. I work for uh, the Downtown Goldsboro Development Office for the City of Goldsboro. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, they're like, we don't like that. Um, I'm the Business and Property Development something. I don't know what that last word is. All right. Anyway, that's it. Okay. Well, I'm with Sheila and Castro. I'm actually a caseworker for DSS, um, and I'm also I also sit on the um, commission on community relations and development board. So thank you all for coming once again. Um, and we're just going to move uh, right along. I know you guys had a long day, <laughs> so we're just going to jump into it to our discussion portion of um, the meeting. And it looks like here. Um, what Christian wanted us to discuss tonight was um, de development of the purpose, scope, and mission of the subcommittee. Uh, and I think this was very important because um, it's such a broad subject, but I kind of think that we need to kind of um, define, you know, this, you know, the scope of what we need to do. Um, so it's open to you all if anyone want to begin or have any thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'm starting. Um, I guess in my mind, it seems like that that this subcommittee exists uh, to make recommendations, to uh, to do some research, uh, of, and make recommendations to the commission, mm -hmm. who then makes recommendations to the council, yes. the city. Um, so that's kind of the chain of things. But I think it's to research and make recommendations related to um, increasing uh, opportunity and economic mobility for low and moderate income citizens mm -hmm. in Goldsboro. Um, and I think there's, a, there's probably a number of ways that may can happen and there's probably a handful of things that are specific to low to moderate um, community mm -hmm. that uh, that can be brought to bear and then there's partnerships and organizations already existing in the community and just trying to collect that information mm -hmm. make sure that there's a handful of actionable things right. that um, that can move the needle yes. for, that, for that community. And um, I agree um, with um, mostly all of everything that Scott said and um, like it was mentioned in the last meeting you know we have a lot of things that are going on in the community um, but uh, a lot of the organizations or a lot of things everyone doesn't doesn't know and in order to to move forward with the economic mobility that is one of the things that we need to understand or be more aware of right. is what each individual organizations are doing and how to best meet the needs of the community. Yes. We know uh, what the at-risk population is, but in order for economic mobility, it, it, it just doesn't focus on the low and moderate, it's everyone. everyone. It's everyone. Exactly. So um, the suggestions and the brainstorming that we do as a subcommittee, hopefully when it reaches the commission and to the city council, I think we're the, the segue to 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 you know for these conversations but 
piggybacking off of what you also said too, Washir, we have to define or outline scopes, yes. uh, scope and objectives. Yes. Because uh, we'll be talking about this going over here, talking about that over there. And once we have the, the goals and objectives identified, we can talk about meeting yes. each of those. And I will also suggest that when we talk about goals and objectives coming from an educational background as well, when you put four or five or six or seven objectives out, it's hard to meet the, so, to meet the so you can see the outcomes. So we need to prioritize those objectives and the scope so therefore we can see, um, we'll be able to measure the outcome. Um, for, for me, one of the biggest things that I kind of look at was the fact that this was a subcommittee of the Commission in Relation uh, for uh, um, our Commission Community Relations and Development. And so I, I, I want to make sure that we, one, one thing is that we are not, you know, that we define that we are not the Commission and that we were just the subcommittee that was developed because there, there evidently is a purpose as it relates to economic development. Um, and so the, what I did is I, I looked at the ordinance and for me um, in looking through this and trying to align to the purpose of the commission where I see that um, we would be making a recommendation to the commission as it pertains specifically it says the commission on community relations development will also serve citizen input mechanism community and in an advisory capacity to the city for community development administrated program funds through the community development block grant. And I know that the CDBG funds can be used for economic development. While I do not know that I have personally seen that that has been how they have been administered in our community. So what, what my interpretation of the purpose for us to do is to look to see if there's any, as, as uh, Scott had mentioned earlier, is there any opportunities? Are there opportunities being left on the table because we are not fully utilizing the capacity of what CDBG could, um, could, could be used for? So that's, um, that's what I um, took away kind of as the purpose when I uh, first talked to uh, Mr. Dumam when he asked me um, to serve. And, uh, and I know that they've got a whole economic development toolkit for CDBG. Um, I'm personally registered for an economic development course through the UNC School of Government and one of the things that I even saw on there was that CDBG funds can be used for this particular course if you are an employee of the municipality. So um, that's what I felt was the, well, the purpose for us was to make recommendations to the Commission as to exploring funding for CDBG funds. All right. And um, I agree. I think that that would be a great area for us to explore because, you know, my thing is with the subcommittee, and I said it in the last meeting, I don't want it to be just another meeting that we have, we sit up here, you know, we give our time and nothing comes out of it. Um, so even if we set small goals, and like you said, even if we move the bar some, you know, we're not expecting to take it all the way to the finish line with just us, you know, it's like you said, it's a partnership. We just move the bar forward. Um, I think that's important. So if we could just outline some objectives, some realistic, you know, clear up, you know, objectives and things that we like to accomplish and, you know, work within that. I think what you said, Craig, the CDBG fund may be a great, you know, a great place for us to, to let's look at it and see what we can do with those funds that will, you know, help um, our, our city. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, let me, if I may, just respond to Craig. Now, in the past few years, um, the city has utilized CDBG for geared towards economic development of pertaining to the Summer Youth Employment Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's the past few years, of course, we couldn't. Uh, initiate the program this year because of COVID. Um, but that has been one of the objectives um, of the Summer Youth Employment Program um, was kind of that economic development piece. Now, um, we certainly are open to what we can do moving forward with the funds. And I just came across um, a press release from HUD the other day that the upcoming CDBG CV funds can be used specifically for economic development. Mm -hmm. Um, so that will be additional funding coming into the city that we can target some economic development. Um, we 
do though under in understanding just how everything works the process the procedures uh, kind of dished out from HUD you know each year we have to um, formulate the annual action plan to say what we're going to do for that year and so currently we're in the final stages of finalizing for 21-22 fiscal year what we're going to do um, and it does entail economic development um, we will be um, presenting on the final plan at next Monday's council meeting so I would love for you guys to tune into that um, to kind of see how that goes provide some feedback this is the final public hearing mm -hmm. for the the 21-22 annual action plan so I, I'm piggybacking off of what you said and also what you pointed out. I think that is um, that uh, some some good points you made because you know you've mentioned Felicia that that some initiative and I you know we have done that over the years. But what are some other things? Yeah, that's what I like. What are some, what are some, what some other things? Do, like you said, yeah, yeah. getting that additional. We don't want to leave funding. nothing on the table right. that we can utilize in our city to help move you know so although we couldn't use we didn't COVID prohibited us from being able to do the summer um, youth initiative what else could yeah. we have done so yeah. then this subcommittee will be helpful to me to kind of help me outline and come up with a scope of work on something that we can do and we have to be specific in the, the actual projects activities right. everything kind of has to be defined so we lay it out and this is what we're going to do yeah. so I, I would definitely yeah, and Welcome so your help with that. Yeah, no, I love that, and 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 I appreciate all the work. First of all, has been done on that action plan. Mm -hmm. um, you guys really need to be commended. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it was also articulated very well. I was on, I, I hopped on the Zoom and saw that. So I just wanted to say publicly that we appreciate the work you all mm -hmm. and the commission has mm -hmm. done. Um, I do think that there's another piece that is is um, is hard for the community to appreciate and understand the value um, but of infrastructure mm -hmm. you know there has been there has been CDBG funding historically utilized on some infrastructure now you know you'd have to dig into that to know when and where and how I'm, I, but there is such a need for it mm -hmm. and such a deficit and when I meet when I say infrastructure what do I mean I'm talking about like water sewer um, making sure that that's run to places like, you know, because some people say, well, why does nothing ever happen over there? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes there's a reason for that. You know, nobody can develop a piece of land, for example, unless there's water and sewer mm -hmm. running that land. Is there a road, you know, going to that property? You know, things like that, that it's hard to, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel like you, you might feel it in your neighborhood, right. but like, an industry has got to have that before they can relocate for example that's where the awareness comes in that's right mm -hmm. that's right and just making sure like so when we say you know economic development it it, it is also it could be initiatives mm -hmm. and things like we were talking about but it could also be something as significant as as infrastructure mm -hmm. and infrastructure is super duper expensive mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you got some Oh, well, I'm just sitting here thinking infrastructure, you know, as, uh, as uh, you know, think about that. I, I think we also need to be kind of cognitive. Uh, and I think even some of the pre-discussions before we got ready to start talking was that uh, the county does have an economic development. Um, th th they've got economic development that happens and they are part of a micro region. And we do have an economic developer for the county. Um, and, the, and it's not that they are not looking at the city, but I think there's a different focus. You know, as I look at economic development, I think of three buckets. The first bucket is expanding what businesses are here. And if we expand what businesses are here, then we create jobs. If we create jobs, we create income mobility, which is great. New business like, uh, like what Scott just mentioned, infrastructure being at the right place. And I know that the economic development uh, offices out of the GTP, which is the region that we're out of, um, they, they look at those things. I know uh, Atlantic Casualty was expanding over there, and, and that's actually something that does affect the city. Um, infrastructure wasn't an issue that they needed to uh, address over there. So there are other state funding things that can happen with that. Um, but then there's this other one, and I think, Scott, I, I know I've had some personal conversations with you, and, and that's looking at growing your own and developing your own. And I know that uh, through what I've looked at through CDBG, 
um, is that there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, and I've just got some of them in front of me, technical assistance and services that you can provide uh, businesses, job training, which is probably what the youth employment fell under, micro business, anything five em employees or under, uh, incubators, I know there's been a lot of talk about incubators around here, we even had some entrepreneurs that were wanting to open up their own incubators, um, expanding existing small businesses, uh, infrastructure is another one that's listed there, and then large scale projects. You know, I think your large scale projects are something that your your economic development, Mark Pope in, in his offices, the county would, it has come to the city and asked for the city's approval on stuff and there have been matching funds that have come through. Yeah, and you know, and I don't know, this is why we have to explore this, but I, and I don't know all the rules on some of this money, um, mm -hmm. but like, let's just take an incubator for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's do that in a, in a micro. If, if you do a building reuse on a historic building, which your historic commercial buildings are going to be downtown, so I'm familiar, very familiar with that. But let's say you did a building reuse on a historic building downtown. Well, all of a sudden, there's like maybe a plethora of funding streams that could be opened up mm -hmm. if it's focused. You know, I think the way the CDB the HUD language is like 51 percent has to meet the low to moderate income yeah. requirement is yeah. that right mm -hmm. but 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 think about this every small business who's hiring wage labor in goldsboro is likely to meet that criteria right that's right yeah. you know what i mean like i mean i think about all the businesses downtown for example mm -hmm. which i always like to say center street in goldsboro is the most diverse street of business within a 40 mile radius mm -hmm. but a lot of those businesses, those micro businesses that are, you know, are going to be that size, five employees or less, if 51% of those are, you know, the HUD-defined designation, mm -hmm. it, it really opens up the door for a lot of potential, you know, um, opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the county right now, I found this last week maybe, in in some of the county's work that they were doing on resilience uh you know in the aftermath of the hurricanes there's like a, re, a, a, a an economic resilience plan mm -hmm. recovery and resilience mm -hmm. plan from several years ago and attached in that uh, data somewhere uh i was able to shoot over and, and click on a link for cdbg resources well there is a series of one pagers that give direction, Dire mm -hmm. simple clarifying direction for like 25 mm -hmm. different options. So that's called working smart and not harder. We have surrounding counties or areas or places that yeah. may be similar to Wayne County and you know in our city to look at what they're doing right. and when it comes to the funding part as you said we have serve, serve, we fall under um, a lot of me ways where we can get means of funding mm -hmm. um, to for to grow our homegrown individuals, as you say, to, to, to grow them. And we was talking about this before the meeting. Like you have places like we was talking about Apple that's coming. We don't want our individuals traveling or living, you know. And so our community isn't mobile. You know, the mobility is not there when we can grow them at home, provide them with the training and the skills they need, but when all of this, with all of this money allocation and how HUD does word some of the things, we fall, we've fallen a lot of things in our community. So it, I have a question, that, and, and I don't know the answer to this, Felicia, you may. Um, because we're a tier one county, mm -hmm. does that keep us from certain funding that we otherwise could get? It seems like my recollection is that the tier one status, if I think we are still tier one, um, which may, means that we're, you know, among the poorest counties. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that, um, that there is some restriction on that. That's why I just think we have to study this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And you may, you know, you may know that answer quicker I than- I don't, but I'm writing it down so I can find out for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. For us. Yeah. And I think it just goes back to um, what Craig was saying about, you know, how the different trainings that are available. That's important, I think, cause, because we don't know a lot, you know, that's why we're up here and we're learning from each other. Um, 
And I think that if we did have access to some different training, so we know that, okay, yeah, we can do this, that, and this with these funds, or no, we can't do this with these funds, um, I think that would help a lot. Um, uh, because, like you were saying, you know, it's so many different ways that that grant can be used. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think definitely more information, more knowledge uh, will be helpful. So let me, well, I don't want to put you on the spot. Because a lot of times, especially with certain monies, if you don't utilize them, like if we didn't utilize the money for the, the economic um, development part for um, the CBG, um, so what happens, what happened to the, did it, is it typically used for something else or if you wouldn't, if you're not able to meet the need of that because it was COVID, like I'm going back on leaving stuff at the table. So what was, what could be alternatives in the future so we won't lose money? Cause oftentimes you lose it if you don't, or they won't roll it. Yeah. We don't want to, we don't want to leave stuff on the table. <laughs> we want to make sure, cause we got a lot of needs in, in, the, in the area to push some of the things for economic development that we have talked about what we have been discussing like so that's that's a whole uh, another thing and awareness is a big part mm -hmm. because you may have some people and I don't know how to the turnover and changeover might be but um, more individuals doing conversations and discussions as such that come from different arenas to able to advise like um, Craig pointed out being the advisory part to take that I mean that 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 would do us well. It's powerful, which is why I'm taking advantage of this setting right now, having you all here um, advising me. I'm, I'm taking it all in. So, like you said, the money, it doesn't go away. It's still there. But we have to come up and create other ways that we can utilize it. So, and again, that's why I would rely on Boost Up Committee, other partners, organizations in the community um, to, to advise and suggest and recommend. Well, you know, one of, one of the things that I see on, on social media, and that can be a dangerous thing being on social media, um, but, but one of the things that I see that uh, typically no matter, uh, and I say no matter, um, that, that's probably not the right term to use, uh, but I, I see a lot of people from different walks of life, different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, and, uh, and even one day when I was over at Wages and we were talking about a program that we were getting going right before COVID started, um, we were talking about entrepreneurs and developing entrepreneurs. And uh, the one thing that the young lady said to me, and I, I know Scott Satterfield's gonna roll his eyes because I've talked about this for uh, I don't know how long, but she said, we need something for, for, for kids to do in this town. We need something for you know, people, um, you know, we, we need a, a this business. And what she said was a trampoline park. And I know that from an economic development standpoint, for, for me, my kids love to go to a trampoline park. They want their birthday party to be a trampoline park. I invite friends that leave Wayne County that go to the trampoline park, and I know not everybody can afford to do that. But when I leave from here and I go to Raleigh, mm -hmm. I pay for all the kids to get in, pay for the party, we go out to dinner, and then my wife's gonna find something that she wants to buy up there. <laughs> so, so I'll spend four or $500 in Raleigh that's going right into the Raleigh mm -hmm. economy. And, and when you look at the east, when you look at eastern North Carolina, minus your anomalies like a Greenville or maybe a Jacksonville or Wilmington, Goldsboro is the best it, that we've got in, in eastern North Carolina. I know people that come from Kinston to go to Chuck E. Cheese because they don't have something like that for their kids. Now, I'm not saying that that's what we should do as far as trying to attract new business, but I would say that it is a different focus than what our current economic developers are doing. Mm -hmm. They're looking at large business large business that has a lot of equipment, provides a lot of jobs, has got a lot of taxation. Um, but I would say that there's probably room for trying to attract some business that could even just keep money in the county that is going out of the county because we just don't have some of the amenities. Now I say that also to, to we mentioned Apple. Um, Apple's gonna have a ripple down effect. Um, you know, right before Apple was Google, right before that was Fuji Films. Um, drive there mm -hmm. to work. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and I'm not so much of a problem as a resident driving there to work because mm -hmm. they make Raleigh money and they bring it back to Goldsboro mm -hmm. and Wayne County to spend it here. I'm okay with that. You know, it might or be a little... Like you said, you'll go to 
money. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just I want them to spend the money here, yeah, that's, right? That's yeah, that's that's what that's what matters is making. So if we can get them, you know, I I don't think we're going to attract an apple here, but if we can get somebody prepared to have an apple job and they want to live here, but the thing too that is is if you go to Riley and you could, housing market up there, it's hard to get a house up there. Yeah. You're not going to get a new one built, mm -hmm. which is why Raleigh builders are building in Wayne County. Mm -hmm. There's Raleigh builders that are developing neighborhoods that have sat dormant for 20 and 30 years. But that also goes back to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, I think you you have money from out of town that would come here. I'm talking big yeah. money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem is, is where do you put it? Right. You know, like you, you, there's only so many places where you can put it that you can tangibly do. Because if somebody's going to put money, anybody who's spending money has to make money. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So that's <laughs> they have to put it where they can make money. Right. So where is that? And right. is that place that they, is that land, you know, so like, so in my mind, it comes down to jobs mm -hmm. and land value. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, is it? Is it ready to receive the investment that money would find it if it was ready to be to be cultivated, right? It's like land, you know, okay, I give you I give you an example of what I mean. If you look, say, um, in like the Rosewood area out by the Walmart. Mm -hmm. You with me? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a bypass mm -hmm. and, and you got seventy. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole lot of land over there for sale. Mm -hmm. You know, hundreds of acres. Literally. Well, why hadn't it developed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we have the sewer capacity to make that happen? You see what I mean? Like, it's not as easy as just go buy the land and then just do the thing. Mm -hmm. There's, so I, I think about if, if the, the tangible recommendations that we make um, lead to, when, when I think about the CDBG, if you could narrow that down to say three focuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah right mm -hmm. and you said we're just going to take these three things that we've learned that are tools that are provided via hud through cdbg or whatever other it doesn't even have to be cdbg it could be there's some state money that's available somehow for a particular type of mm -hmm. development and we said hey we're going to focus on these three things and we're going to build whatever we build whatever goals we set mm -hmm. are going to be filled in those buckets because we know there's some funding source that could make it possible for somebody to invest their capital alongside of whatever else is happening. And that development leads to increased opportunity and economic mobility. Whatever, whatever happens in those directions for our work. So then yeah. on top of that, what you just mentioned, on top of the the land, the location, how much land we may have, attracting individuals that want to build, we, we may have some place, like that's a beautiful place, mm -hmm. but when we think about some of the other things that are barriers to our low to moderate, which is transportation. Right, that's right. We don't have the transportation, we have, we have transportation, but when we talk about economic mobility, I mean, it's a certain time frame that it cuts off. Mm -hmm. I mean, that transportation stops. Yeah. It's not that the individuals may not want to work, it's the transportation barrier. Mm -hmm. you, you understand what Absolutely. I'm saying? So we, we yeah. may have beautiful you know, areas to build, but when we're talking about the feasibility of, okay, we got the building. I mean, we got, we build, we bring in the business, we're gonna put it in this location. But we're looking at the target population of the low to moderate, mm -hmm. and a lot of them do not have transportation. Right. We're not even talking about the socioeconomic status because yeah. everyone is not residing, that's low to moderate is not residing, they're not residing in housing. Right. They're residing out in the community sure. in general. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the feasibility of, we know what the target population is. We have a developer that wants to develop here, so how do we target? The transportation barrier. How do we make sure that they're getting the Wayne aware of they to get the skills and the training that they need to be able to apply? That's right. You know, so it's like a ripple effect. I agree. You have one and may not have the other. So how do you cultivate the learning, the skill of these individuals? How do we bring a upgrade our transportation yes. so that it can be their transport and here, there, the southern end? Yes. It's hard for them to get transportation to come here, Mount Olive. They want to spend a lot of money in Seven Spring, a lot of money in Wayne County, but guess what? Sometimes the transportation is a barrier, mm -hmm. you know? 
And so that is the thing outside of the location, right. the funding. It's the feasibility of the target population that we want to reach in order to enhance our economic stability or mobility. Yeah, and, and I'm glad that you started bringing this up, really, because what you're doing is you're touching on workforce right now. Because we we can get the business here, but then do we have the people to employ, be employed, so that business can succeed? And uh, I, I, I believe a couple of you have probably been on an email where we're doing a workforce survey right now, and we're trying to get some folks. I, I've got access to the data. I can pull economic development data all day long and say how many jobs are roughly available and you know where are the jobs at, what industries they are, what the pay is. Um, but but there's nothing like hearing it directly from the employer. So the survey is going out, and I can just tell y'all some some preliminary things that I'm seeing as they come through. One, applications are down. They are not getting the applicants that they were once getting. Um, some employers are saying they get about 50% reduction in applicants, which could be due to transportation. That could be one of the issues why the applicant, uh, applicants are down. Um, there's, of course, some employers that are saying it's because of additional unemployment benefits, but the number of people filing for unemployment are not the number that, that these folks are looking for. I mean, there's, there's, there's job opportunities, but when you look at that, one of the other um, sets of questions is, oh, if you had a candidate that applied, why didn't you hire them? And it comes down to skills. And when I say skills, it's not one skill. It's a, it's a skill that you've got the occupational skill, you've got the education, you've got the soft skills, and then the other one, uh, what was the fourth one at that point? Um, oh, work experience. Those four things rank at the top. And uh, su surprisingly, I, I, you'll hear this sometimes when you're, when you're speaking with, with, um, with employers is that they don't have issues with, with getting um, certain people to apply or they, don't, uh, or they do have issues with getting certain people to apply. Um, I would say that one thing that I think we should help to educate people on applying is those who may have had previous substance abuse problems right. and have criminal records because those two came up to the bottom two for reasons why they didn't offer someone a job. Um, and so, but, but there's people that I've talked to that said, I, I can't apply for a job there. And the reason why they said I can't apply for a job is they've got the, they've got the mindset that because I do have a criminal background, I, I will, I'll never get the job. I can tell you there are businesses, there, some of them said that they're going to hire 50 additional people this year, but they're having a harder time this year than what they did last year during the middle of COVID than the unemployment issues that we were having the year before that too. But, and I guess what I'm saying is, is let's take that issue and let's say that one of the places we wanted to drill down on was that. Yeah. Okay, if you, if you know that there's an assumption that the college is the skill builder, right? Maybe. It Maybe. Could, could be. Could let's be, right? Public, it could be public use, schools. could be on-the-job right. training. Let's use, let's use the community college as an example in this particular case. Mm -hmm. And let's say that they're providing these, these necessary skills that are required to 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 be uh, employed in these industries or whatever. And we drilled down and we said, all right, we're going to every for one of our focuses, we're going to do everything we can to make recommendations that would improve the ability of a citizen, no matter where they live, to know that information and to be able to execute on that information and get those folks to the place where they can get those skills so that those applications tick up, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's, I'm just like, let's just use that as an example of how I sort of see our role here. If that is one thing that happened and you had a 10% increase mm -hmm. even in the participation of people who were taking advantage of those skill building opportunities, and there may be a way to pull, instead of getting people to the college, it may be how do we get the college to the people? I don't know yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But my point is, is if you just had a 10% increase even, that'd be a huge benefit to the community. Mm -hmm. So, like, even if you just focused on that one specific issue, we've got a skill deficit, mm -hmm. and people don't know or cannot get to the skill building whatever factory, well, I, I can say on the opposite end, because I work closely with um, <laughs> with the Wayne Community College, with Ms. Renita Dawson and her mm -hmm. whole team. Yeah. I know the efforts and the work that their department, especially with the, all the, 
our college, see all the um, continuing education classes, all the, the new programs, and even in talks, because I'm on their engagement committee, and talks with trying to go to on, down south, Mount Olive, in that area with using, utilizing buildings so that those individuals can get trained. Mm -hmm. Going to, trying to come into the community. Let me tell you what is limiting some of these things, awareness. A lot of individuals do not know, and mm -hmm. the reason why I, I'm an individual that know is because we work closely, we partner closely, and I'm on um, their engagement committee that they have that has a lot of different organizations that are there. And when I tell you some, some of the organizations don't know all the things that Wayne community has. Right. We're privy to it because we linked a lot of our residents or like we have, we have a cohort that we created within that we either, you know, they're, they're doing it virtually, but they're getting ready to go to Wayne community for computer literacy, computer, computer classes, because we know 21st century, you need to know how to fill out applications. You need to know how to do this, that, and the other. And um, um, bank on Wayne. They can't do it face to face, but financial literacy we know is, so they're doing virtual things, but everybody is not privy or, or, or can't do the same thing or they're just not aware of what. And that's how as a community, we help and do our part with building this. We have a, a college that they don't have to go here, there and everywhere. We know that transportation is a barrier. I can say um, that I know that they're doing their part when it comes to the business. I'm talking about, and it's a plethora of new programs that wasn't even back just a year ago before the pandemic mm -hmm. and trying to ensure and not all of them you, you don't have to get an associate's degree you got a trade there's a lot of trades when i think about all <laughs> the school stuff that i went i'm like I, these trades because they're making money yeah and the apprenticeship i mean like to me the yeah. one of the most brilliant things that the college has done and, and craig you you're responsible for that in many ways could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so and I'll, I do want to say this, though, before we get to that, is we've done a great job in um, trying to educate people that you don't necessarily have to go to one of the uh, fine universities in North Carolina and have a bachelor's degree, um, but we also have not done justice to let people know that sometimes it's not even an associate's degree that you need. So to your point, Dr. Perkins, you're absolutely right. Um, there is one employer who's on our board of trustees and he said all they need is a high school diploma and if they can do some basic math and understand a little bit of manufacturing concepts I'll start them off anywhere from 14 to 18 dollars an hour I will pay 80 percent of their benefits they pay 30 dollars every two weeks for their uh, for their health insurance and he pays everything but one dollar for the um, vision and dental and 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 that that's that's no college education but they got to have a little bit of an understanding of manufacturing. They got to have some of those soft skills right. um, were some of the issues that you see in there. But um, with, with, with apprenticeships, you know, I, I think the thing that really works well and, and, and what I've been telling employers is, um, you know, for too long, we've thought about this, either you're employed or you're getting educated. Why can't you be employed and get educated at the same time? Mm -hmm. That's it. So we, we've had some great uh, strides moving forward with working with employers to provide the related instruction for their registered apprenticeship program while they're working. And one of our most successful programs, we offer this one day a week. So the employer, uh, some, some employers pay for them to be in the classroom. So they're inside the classroom getting paid and then they're working four days a week um, they'll get, uh, depending on where they're working at, they can get up to 50 hours worth of pay um, with some of it being while they're inside the classroom. In some of those instances, they can earn a full associate's degree while they're doing that. The other benefit to this is if, if we can educate our children in school and we can work with our employers to make this sort of ecosystem of development is that they can also get a tuition waiver to be able to go into any training that is happening at the college um, but the, the, the kicker to that is when you're talking about somebody who's already would have qualified for a Pell Grant, they'll still get their Pell Grant. So now when you talk about transportation, all of a sudden they might be able to afford a car that can get them back and forth to work and back and forth to school. Mm -hmm. So that could be an opportunity. Um, and, and I'm very passionate about that, but I do want, I do want to say that there are some decent paying jobs that you only have to have a high school diploma and some sense of what the job is. Um, maybe a little bit of a manufacturing environment and 
you know, sometimes, yes, those are hard manual labor type jobs. I mean, if they weren't, Mike Rowe would not have a TV show yeah. <laughs> about dirty jobs. Um, but uh, I, there, there's opportunities there. And, and to your point, Scott, you mentioned, yeah, how, how do we get that information to some of the people? So that, that's a, another thing. I was in another meeting and this, and I was talking to a, a I forgot what organization, um, community organization, is, you know, giving some tips grassroots is, the, is what we need to do. Yeah. We can't expect for um, the city to do, you know, word of mouth. We can't expect for Facebook to do everything right. or um, Instagram, Snap, whatever. We can. We have to go in these communities. We have to go and pass, send, um, send put it in the newspaper because some people get the newspaper, some people don't. We have to do the grassroots part. We can't expect Wayne community. They don't have enough staff to cover this whole area. So we have to use every um, area, every, every method that we can to ensure that we get those things. Because guess what? A lot of individuals, they may hear it tonight, they may have seen a flyer, but not know, because a lot of people, and I know back in the day, that's what they taught, college, 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 college. But these trades and how they're paying um, students, that's, in school, that's how they get this. You get the academic, the book part, but then hands on when you get the job, you get those skills that, you, you understand what I'm saying? And we're not, I'm not gonna say we're not, it's not the awareness is not in our community because we need to do grassroots. Now I think that's what- You mentioned that at the first meeting about getting out, and I think we call them community ambassadors. Yeah. Yeah, getting yeah. out and going out to the community. Right. And that's why I think partnership comes in, partnering with community agencies because look how many people go to WIC, look how many people go to DSS, you know, look how many people go to um, wherever, whatever community, housing, you know. So, I mean, if we get that information to those, to those places where people with lower income go, then they'll say, oh, hey, look at this flyer. Oh, my God, I saw this. So that's where I believe, you know, partnering with, you know, community agencies definitely come into play. And so churches. Yeah, churches, and churches, places we know that yeah. a lot of individuals definitely. happen to go yeah. to yeah. have literature that's there that would be, you know, that would be eye-catching and seeing. Right. There's a lot of, in the places that you name, yeah, they're, the low to moderate. Yes. And even, I mean, it just depends on the situation, especially during this pandemic, other individuals that may be at this point in time at a different socioeconomic right. status. Yeah. We, you know, because the opportunities are here. And if we want to grow them here mm -hmm. and, and give them this so the monies can come back, we need to do our part in making sure that the individuals are aware. Mm -hmm. And then to knock down as many barriers that we can because they are a lot of jobs. And I'm talking about not jobs that just pay minimum wage. I'm talking about jobs that will call and say, when you, when you guys are doing a, um, another job fair yeah. to host, because it's a lot. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a lot of um, jobs that have vacancies, right. a lot. Yeah, There's the, a career fair today, right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the middle school career fair um, yeah. was happening today, and uh, you know the chamber mm -hmm. put that one on. And, you know, all in all, I think there's there there are opportunities. I think there is a barrier. There's a, a block between the opportunities and getting them to the people that need the opportunities. Um, we we do know that uh, um, job development or job there, there's a component to this, and we know this through the through the city um, already even doing the uh, the summer youth employment program. Um, you know, I, I think there's something to getting youth involved, um, and there's some other initiatives that that can come right along with that, but. And even your your adults right now, um, I, I'm surprised sometimes of employers that don't know about WIOA, um, and especially with the OJT. When when you look at OJT from WIOA, a, a WIOA recipient can get up to 50% of their wages paid through WIOA while they're on the job if they're part of an on-the-job training program. Well, in this survey that's being administered right now, guess what the number one thing is that people use to develop um, employees? On the job training so if that's the case how do we get the the people that will qualify for ojt how do we get the employers to also understand the ojt and uh and get that and and i don't know you know is, is this part of the economic development uh subcommittee's responsibility or the um you know is this something cbdg can can actually well help fund I, I don't know but so yeah and i that's why I, i'm trying to i'm sitting here trying to formulate 
what one of those you know recommendation or goal areas might be under that it, like if, if we had like a, a mission or purpose statement that said provide research and make tangible recommendations to the Commission to increase opportunity and economic mobility and then under that one of the key areas was awareness mm -hmm. of existing opportunities Wait, yeah because I like I mean it incorporates broad and incorporates yeah. everything and right. then you yeah, yeah. so if we have it I'm sorry that's okay <laughs> provide research and make tangible recommendations to the Commission and you can spell out Commission on Community Relations and Development to increase opportunity and economic mobility and even with that part especially with data because data to be data driven Craig has look he yeah. has everything that's that right. we as far as and I'm pretty sure you do yeah. too but yeah. we don't have to recreate the wheel that's Maybe right that's right that's a got, hell that's a hell yeah. thing right mm -hmm. so if that's the overarching sort of mission okay. and then underneath that we said for example um, uh, we said increase, oh, like if we got really specific, we might say increase awareness for job training programming. And opportunities. And opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then under that, under that specific goal, you said utilize existing networks. Mm -hmm. yeah. You talked about partnerships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another bullet would be maybe host career fairs mm -hmm. in, um, uh, you know, in areas where there's maybe a communication deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, number three might be uh, on the ground canvassing. Mm -hmm. But I think that even the on the ground canvassing and the, and the utilizing existing networks, all that still needs to be specific about a thing because if it's like, here's 10 things mm -hmm. you guys need to know about, mm -hmm. I think you you may you may get no traction. Right. Well, that's why it's called in the educational world. It's and you probably really it's smart goals. You make mm -hmm. it specific, mm -hmm. so it can be measurable. Right. That's right. You know, yeah. That's right. So so we and so we've got time where we can drill down on that language and exactly what that goal needs to be. But I think we already know that awareness is going to be a key goal. Mm -hmm. That whatever we do, there needs to be awareness in the community yeah. as a whole for some specific opportunities that already exist, right? Okay, so let me recap. What I have as the mission is provide research and tangible recommendations, dot, 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 we get a reference to see from the live, and then one of the goals, um, the number one goal is increase activity for job development, and then, um, oh, 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 oh. And increase awareness. Increase awareness for yep. job development. Well, Increase awareness mm -hmm. of um, it was opportunities of, yeah, mm -hmm. training. It yeah, was of, training of skill building mm -hmm. opportunities because that might look a lot of different ways mm -hmm. depending on the age, depending on the demographic. Mm -hmm. It might be Wayne Community College, it might be the business and industry center, it might be whatever that might be. I don't know because okay, it may be. I would say he said initially he said training and then opportunities because those are different so you have the training part to train the individuals that need and then you have the opportunities that like whether it's you know on the job a lot of the um, I would say the workforce opportunities that they have so it's two different yes it's two different mm -hmm. And number two, number two, you know, might be, um, you know, thinking through uh, tr transportation solutions to make uh, to make these opportunities, whether they be jobs or skill building activities, more accessible. So, do you want to short line it to say um, uh, develop ways to decrease barriers, and then put that as yeah. objectives yeah, under there? You know, yeah, I like that. Because yep. it may be another barrier. That's what. That's right. There may be another barrier, but I'm trying to think very like singularly if I can, because I'm trying to think about what what can be measured. Mm -hmm. If right. if if the reducing of the barriers, we might not be able to address three, but we could address one. Mm -hmm. And if we're out there trying to seek money out, we can find out. Like we can really 
get really serious about mm -hmm. that one issue. Mm -hmm. Next year, we can focus on another barrier, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, mm -hmm. where you could try to see some tangible movement mm -hmm. that you can turn around and say, look what we did, mm -hmm. you know, look what the commission did, look what the city did or the right. community did, look what our partners did together, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and we, we were able to sort of pull some money, build a network, <clears throat> you know, whatever. Are there other barriers that could be identified? I know Scott, you suggested that you're working on one at a time, but are there others that you can go ahead and line up? Once we get over a transportation barrier, then what would be the next one? Just that funding. Well, I, I think one of the things that we could do um, that that would probably be who of us is like if we if we can just say you know job training is going to be one of the aspects that we're going to look at because I'm, I'm looking at the CBDG mm -hmm. um, economic development toolkit right now and it says these are the uh, these are the uh, the steps for success to optimize prospects for success mm -hmm. in this program conduct a needs assessment identify economic yes. sectors with greatest employment opportunities form partnership between employers, residents, service agencies, and community institutions, address barriers to employment, mm -hmm. develop soft skills training, create a flexible program, define performance measures, consider other sources of funding, and research other innovative steps that increase the rate of success. So email me that so that yeah, it's right that inside that the toolkit. Now, hey, it, it's, it's about a, it's a 195 page document. So yeah. that was gonna be. It's page 70 though. Yep. That was going to be to one of, well, I would suggest, it's just my personal suggestion because you hit on it. We, we would, we don't, let me see, and it's probably already been done, is the needs assessment. Yeah. Until we, as a, the commission, because mm -hmm. we just, advise, you know, find out exactly what and how, although we targeted some things, I think that needs, if you don't have a, if you don't have a formal one, Right. You may need to do a needs assessment. Yeah. I was going to say that earlier when you were talking about the funding, the county commissioners and how the yeah. monies. I, and then you mentioned something else, Scott. Well, I just say that. I mean, I, I love that because it's a great recommendation yeah. for an action plan. Mm -hmm. step. Yeah. That's yeah. directly from the community. Right. 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 I think that may be a number, an, an, an objective if we don't already have one. Well, we and we might could do that to the reducing barriers goal. Yes, that's yeah, that, that's that we create a needs assessment. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so I can I can think of a couple things that are already kind of in the works that could help out with this. You know, one would be the workforce survey that we've got out to employers uh -huh. right now. Um, you know, we've got it extended out until April 30th right now, so the end of the week. Um, we'll, we'll close that off. Um, we've had a fair amount of, of course, the, our largest employers are the ones that are really hurting for labor needs. So they're the ones quickly to take a survey like that because they want you know to get some help. Um, and, and you know, Dr. Perkins, I know that you've had some of the conversations that we've been in about this uh, homegrown talent initiative that we've been talking about. Um, so, so I think those are two pieces. But the next uh, kind of um, planned thing after the survey was to do, uh, and I've been working with the Workforce Development Board on this, is what they call a next-gen partnership meeting. Mm -hmm. And it's where you put uh, the employers all in front of the room, you have a moderator, they're in the middle, all of your partners on the outside. Mm -hmm. You listen to the people in the middle, that moderator asks some questions that are gonna be specifically about data that was collected during that survey. And then the thing that, the, the, the key to this at the end is when you look at um, private versus government, and you tell somebody in the private world, how would you get something done? Like, what would you do? Who do you think back here, all these partners sitting around listening to you, who do you think is best to, to attack this problem? And how would you attack it if you were them? And then listen to what they've got to say, because what, what, what's happened, one thing, and I've talked about this model for about four or five years now, um, the state has really uh, commended this community for doing it. Uh, it. It happened out in the Catawba County area. It's a program called K64. And it's the looking at workforce development from kindergarten to uh, 64 years old or when you would retire from the workforce. Some of the very, uh, uh, I, I just, they, they, were, they were forward thinking in things. Yeah. Like they were doing career awareness in the seventh grade, but they realized that there were computer issues and not all the kids could search for the career. So they raised, the, the, the uh, local government put up some funds and said, you can get these funds after you raise a matching private fund. And so what they did is they said, okay, well, the first need we know is that our kids in the public schools need some uh, devices to be able to do these online assignments, to be able to find careers that are available right there in their county. Um, and so what did they have? They had devices. And when a pandemic hit, what weren't they scrambling to get? They weren't scrambling to get devices, not like what we were. Um, but there's, there's a lot of other things that they've done that is just 
so forward thinking, like the latest thing is instead of addressing soft skills when someone has graduated from high school and has made it on into a college or maybe they didn't make it to college and, um, and, and they're trying to get an interview and somebody says, you need some soft skills training. Instead of trying to correct, correct things that were years worth of learning, they have did this, uh, this thing where they're we're doing in elementary where they're giving a DESA survey to kids to understand their social and emotional needs while they're in elementary school and they've outfitted all of the teachers with a, a character building curriculum that they can help the kids to understand what their own needs are and then to help develop that so they don't have the soft skills when, when they get out of school. Um, and saying that, lo and behold, guess what the state is mandating that they do? All these teachers are gonna be trained in this kind of character building. So I was talking with Dr. Manning at the public schools. Um, that is a new initiative that's getting ready to come down from the state is about social and emotional needs of children yes. in elementary yes. school. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's there's a lot of good things kind of already in the works, um, but you know I think that th this could help. You know I, I think it's pretty obvious tonight that you know job job training opportunities is one area we'd like to focus on. Um, but you know but I, I didn't want to leave any of the other things out because there's so many other things that could happen. So is is something like is small business development? Well, and I think I think these. I see this conversation as ongoing, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and I, I think that while this is a temporary committee, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. I don't think we should. Um, I don't think we should um, arbitrarily put a deadline on it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that we can take the next meeting and think through some some tangible goals mm -hmm. after this discussion, mm -hmm. like this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, nothing to say we can't talk to one another then, in between Then we time. can identify the scope. Yeah, and then we can come back and we've got a mission. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got that first, mm -hmm. you know, goal, first one or two goals where we have to. awareness and job training, mm -hmm. you know, maybe. And then developing ways to decrease barriers, which we don't, we haven't identified. Oh, that's goal number two. Yeah. Two then there, there's two. Yeah. Uh huh. Under. Mm hmm Okay. Mm hmm So we, when we, when you was going over that, there was, you, we got the first goal, and it had some objectives under that, the main uh -huh, goal. Uh -huh, then uh -huh. number then the two, we reduce barriers. Yes. That's right. That's right. And then transportation would be under that. And, maybe and then we're talking about a, the needs assessment, because out of that needs assessment, yeah, yes. it'll be. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in looking at that, for, for for the for the economic development toolkit, all of that falls under one category, mm -hmm. and that's the job training. The job training. Mm -hmm. So, are all the barriers and everything. As a matter of fact, you've got to come up to be able to get it approved. You actually got to come up with a program, and these are all of the things that they're going to look for okay, so inside then, of that. So that's in job training. So, yeah. so that's definitely an area we want to focus on. Yeah, and you know, it might there might be. Um, um, and, and it's already seven o'clock, but we're close to seven. But I would say, in the area of small business, I don't know how to say this in a general way, but whatever would capture um, building entrepreneurial capacity and identifying capital. Yes, absolutely. Those so, would be the two bullets underneath the small business development. So that'd be the number three. And that might be that number three. That's number three. Yeah. What's that? We can continue yeah. on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, down down and, and if you if you don't mind providing like a like a document that gives us an outline of what we said tonight, like yeah. here's our mission and here's goal one, mm -hmm. some All some bullets. Things. Here's goal two and right. some bullets. Right. And then here's goal three. We started, but we hadn't finished. And then that way we, we pick it back up. We know right where to pick back up. Is that? So number three, just so we cleared, and we're going to come back and discuss, it was job training as one of the objectives. And then under that, small business and whatever else flows. Well, so small business would be a separate category. A separate ca okay. Yeah, separate category. Yes, yes. And then next month we'll discuss what the objectives are. Yes, okay, gotcha. Yeah, because I think the one thing that we definitely need to do, if our purpose is, is part of that purpose is to make recommendation as far as the, the use of funds, you know, for mm -hmm. a plan, obviously at this point it's gonna probably be the next fiscal year's right. plan, not, mm -hmm. not this coming one. Um, job training would be one of them, the mm -hmm. small business. I, I think one of the things we need to, to dive into a little bit mm -hmm. is what is eligible and what's not. Because right. in the document, they talk a lot about what is eligible and what's not. That's right. I so like when that. you talk about small business, yes. incubators will come up. 
and incubators got a whole set of standards right. Right. as to what you can and cannot do. And the good thing about the incubator discussion, I'll just say for as a sidebar, a little teaser, is that we've we've done quite a bit of work. Well, there's a feasibility study that already exists on the books that's been provided for multiple locations for the purpose of incubator that's already had contribution into it and there's pro formas for financially how that could happen where you could get money um, there's just some data that is already like you say pre-existing already mm -hmm. there that could help could feed that help feed that um, that that need or support mm -hmm. that need so that's great, man. This is this is exciting. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. You know, in the words of Christian, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah. excited about what's to come. Um, anybody else have any final comments or remarks? I just appreciate you all for being here. Yes, I'm and just, I do appreciate yeah. you, Felicia, for being here tonight, and all of you guys for taking time out of your day or evening to come mm -hmm. be with us. And I, I believe I, I, I'm um, grateful for this subcommittee mm -hmm. um, because outside of the commission, there are other voices, organizations, and like you said, pu pulling everything together so that we can have mobility in our area. So this was this was a great um, move move forward. Right. I believe I believe it was. Right, and it looks yeah, like. Shout out our vice chair. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Maya. Yes. And um, it looks like um, Christian has set the next meeting for May 25th. So hopefully that day works for you all. Like if not, you know, just let Christian know if that's going to be an issue for you. Um, and I think if that's going to be it, you know, that's all. We're going to stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right.